This is the United States foreign policy since the end of the Cold War, and we are now on class number 12, in which we're going to talk a little bit about United States foreign policy and the war on terror. Um, for this class, actually, we're going to concentrate on the Bush administration, um, which was in office from the year during the years 2001 2009. And in the next class, we'll consider a bit more fully the Obama and also the Trump administration's uh, um, uh, policies uh, when it comes to the global war on terror. So as I say, I'm primarily concerned with looking today at the basically the six or seven years after the 9-11 attacks and the, as I say, the particular policies that the Bush administration pursued. Um, and then we will sort of build on from that in, in, in the next class when we talk a little bit about Obama and Trump and uh, those policies that they have pursued since then. However, the war on terror is still very much with us. I think this was a headline I found last year. Um, and the beginning, it says Bolton. This is a reference to John Bolton, who was for a while... Uh, President Trump's national security advisor. He eventually resigned. Um, but this headline describes the, the title. It says US troops, obviously US soldiers, will not leave Syria till ISIS beaten and Kurds protected. Advisor indicates long stay for troops while President claims he never said the withdrawal would be quick. Um, so the headline there demonstrating that the war on terror is very much um, continuing. Photograph there showing some armoured trucks, armoured vehicles. It says US Marine Corps tactical vehicles are seen driving along a road near Tal Bayada in Syria's northeastern, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Haseka province. Um, so almost 20 years on from the 9-11 attacks, we're still very much living with the consequences of the war on terror. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about Trump uh, and his views on the war on terror and the various wars in which the United States has found itself engaged in um, in the next class. Uh, for now, I think it's worth noting, though, that Bolton, um, you know, after you know, after, after this newspaper story, uh, did in fact resign, and actually President Trump took the initiative to actually withdraw a significant number of American troops in Syria. So that perhaps you know, the Bolton perhaps encapsulates more John Bolton's views about the war on terror rather than President Trump. And, and um, we'll talk a little bit about Bolton because he was actually a figure. Um, in the Bush administration um, in the early 2000s and uh, I, and uh, so he you know, he played a role he wasn't a particularly important figure he was I think for a while ambassador to the United Nations but nonetheless he, he you know he was part of the administration's response to the 9-11 attacks so we'll come on to him and his views um, and the other, and the visions of our like-minded colleagues um, in a moment. One other thing before we get on to a little bit of the history here, uh, this map, uh, which again I think I found a year or two ago, so it might not be entirely up to date, but and I'm not going to go through every single point on this particular map. Uh, what it does show, however, is America's involvement in different countries in various parts of the world. This map obviously showing primarily Africa, the Middle East, Europe. Um, and the headline below that uh, saying that the US counter-terror war involves 39% of the world's countries. I should have included the source actually, and I haven't, and I can't quite remember exactly where I found it. As I say, it's, it was a year or so, year or two ago so uh, it might not be entirely up to, up to date but even if it is a sort of rough representation of what the United States has been doing the clear you know the clear message that comes out of this 
of this map is that American military activities have been extremely widespread. So the, so the uh, countries in the light grey, which is yeah, a large part of Africa, Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, India, countries in which there is light grey are countries in which there is some form of military activity now that could presumably could be anything um, yeah, possibly just the mere presence of American troops of some description um, but nonetheless you know the fact the map does show that American forces are very widely spread around different countries and again we come back to a point I made in an earlier class of being with that but the United States is the only country in the world which has uh, the sort of global dispersion, if you like, of military forces. No other country, not even China, sort of can come close to matching the United States' ability to to uh, uh, project its influence globally. But yeah, countries in light warp grey are countries in which, uh, as I say, there is some sort of mil American military activity. Countries in darker shades of grey are countries in which there are actually combat operations so you have american military forces actually doing some form of fighting uh countries where you have that stripe these are countries <coughs> excuse me these are countries in which there are um um uh, what does it say air and drone strikes so attacks from the air so this includes countries like libya um which is sort of dark gray and stripes which pr presumably means that you know includes combat operations and airstrikes similar for uh, uh um, ethiopia um iraq etc 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 so you know you, we, we get a we get a you know a feeling um so yeah when bush proclaims after 9 11 that he was launching a global war on terror um uh, I think we can say fairly, you know, that he, you know, he was speaking the truth. It has been a global war on terror. It has been, you know, it, it has it has involved the United States in many different parts of the world. There's a smaller map of, of, of South America, which for obvious reasons the United States has been less involved in, with, in compared to sort of North Africa or Middle East. Um, but nonetheless, you know, as I say, this has very much been a global war on terror. Okay. Now, what is interesting about the United States and terrorism is that until 9-11, there hadn't actually been a great deal of actual terrorism on American soil itself. Um, if you contrast the United States with Europe, for example, yeah, um, terrorism in the United States in the 1990s or even during the Cold War, uh, this was not this had not been a particular problem for the United States, uh, whereas plenty of European countries uh, terrorism had been uh, you know, a, a significant uh, uh, a significant problem which governments were having to grapple with. I mean, I come from Britain. I grew up in Britain in the 1980s, and I still have very clear memories of uh, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, planting bombs every night. You would turn on the news, and you know there'd be news about a bomb going off somewhere or a soldier being shot, uh, things like that. Um, in comparison to Britain or Spain with ETA or, or Italy and the Red Army, in comparison with these countries, as I say, terrorism had not been a significant uh, issue for the United States until 9-11. There had been one or two incidents though. Um, 1993, again, I remember this day quite well actually. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I mean, I was quite young at the time, but it was just before I was off to university. Um, but um, um, yeah, 1993, there is a precursor of the 9-11 attack when there is actually an attack on the World Trade Center in New York. On this occasion, it's a massive car bomb which is detonated in the underground, in an underground car park under, underneath one of the towers. Um, and again, it was organized by, uh, I'm not sure if Al-Qaeda itself existed, but certainly by a figure who was to become uh, very closely involved in Al-Qaeda. Um, the plan was, I think, was to set off this bomb uh, at, in the hope that it would actually lead to the collapse of one of the towers. Of course, it didn't, but it did, you know, it did cause an awful lot of damage. 
killed a few people. And as I say, it was a sort of precursor to you know, what would happen um, eight years later. Um, two years later, you have a much more, I say much more, but, 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 but probably until 9-11, the single biggest sort of terrorist attack to actually occur on American territory itself. Um, this was a bombing of, um, uh, a, I think it was a Federal Reserve uh, building in Oklahoma City or some kind of government building. I forget exactly what it was now. Um, again, it killed a lot of people. Um, it, you know, it was a very sort of traumatic attack. However, the people who perpetrated it were not radical Islamic terrorists, but rather homegrown American um, right wing extremists who were against the federal government. As I said, this had this was not you know an, an attack by a radical Islamic group, which again is worth noting. Um, outside the United States itself, though, American forces were targeted uh, on a few occasions um, in the in the 1990s. It should be said, I mean, there'd been previous serious terrorist attacks against American forces uh, based abroad as well during the 1980s. Um, a load of American Marines, for example, have blown up in Lebanon, I think, in the 1980s and things like that. Um, so there had been, you know, there had been a few examples, as I said, of American military forces abroad, abroad outside the United States being subjected to terrorist attacks. Um, but there was, a very, again, very serious um, bombing bombings occurring in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998 when two massive bombs are detonated in the grounds of American embassies. And these are were being per perpetrated by Al-Qaeda, a group which was not at that time very well known, uh, at least outside the intelligence community. But it was in some ways, you know, a, a again, a precursor, I suppose, to what would, what would actually happen after 9-11. A couple of years later, again, 2000, so the year before 9-11, again, Al-Qaeda strikes against an American target. This time it's against an American warship, the USS Cole, uh, which was in port in Aden in 2000. And I think, if I remember correctly, you know, again, it's a sort of bomb or maybe it was a missile. I can't remember, but it ripped a huge hole in the ship. Um, and yeah, as I say, these bombings in 98 and then again in 2000, you know, these were indications, if you like, that Al Qaeda was beginning to become a significant sort of threat, a significant, you know, a significant area of concern. Um, which is the final point on this on, on this slide here, that clear that Al Qaeda was becoming a sort of major threat to uh, the United States even before 9/11. Now, Al Qaeda itself. Uh, as an organization was led by Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden himself had kind of emerged. Well, first of all, he was he was part of a very rich Saudi Arabian family. <coughs> His father was a very successful businessman. Um, but bin Laden himself had actually traveled to Afghanistan in the 1980s and participated in the war against uh, um, Russian soldiers, Soviet troops in Afghanistan before the withdrawal. Um, after that, um, in the 1990s, he sort of begins to develop, uh, he, he comes together to, he, he organizes, I should say, a new group, uh, uh, um, Al-Qaeda, which in Arabic roughly translates as the base. I think like in English, the base has sort of multiple meanings in Arabic. It can mean literally like a base, a military base, something like that. Or it can mean something like a foundation, like the base of something. Um, and I'll, and uh, Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda begin to become active. Main, I think, one of the decisive moments, let's say, in the organization's development is um, the Gulf War in 1991, when Iraq invades Kuwait and the United States assembles a big international coalition to to uh, uh, to liberate Kuwait. Um, it's important because after 1991, 
the United States continues to have a very, very strong military presence in the Middle East, and particularly in Saudi Arabia, which is especially problematic for Osama bin Laden, because Saudi Arabia is the Muslim holy land, you know, it has several important shrines, not least Mecca, of course, um, you know, the Islamic holy city. Um, so the presence of American soldiers in Saudi Arabia was something that Saudi, that something that, that Osama bin Laden and other radical Muslims found particularly uh, offensive. Um, as a consequence of that, Osama bin Laden and, and others, they begin this mission, I suppose, of wanting to try and eliminate Western influence in the Muslim world. Above all, they have a sort of vision to establish a Muslim caliphate, so a sort of Muslim state with very strict Islamic law, which is something, of course, which uh, we've seen emerge more recently in the shape of the Islamic State. Um, and, you know, in, in Osama's vision, he was thinking of a long struggle against uh, against the United States and other Westerns and, and you know, other Western countries, other European countries. So this is the context when George W. Bush becomes the 43rd president of the United States at the beginning of 2001. Um, Bush, of course, the son of George H.W. Bush, who had been president from 1989 to 1993. So as I always say, it gets somewhat confusing because we have two George Bushes as president uh, with only eight years between them. Um, but yeah, we're talking about Bush younger, the younger Bush. And he was president, of course, from 2001 to 2009. Um, when Bush begins his presidency, first of all, it's important to say that Bush, when he was elected, he's elected in very controversial circumstances. So the 2000 election um, is a very, very narrow election victory for Bush. Um, the deciding state was Florida and there were all kinds of um, things happening in Florida, which were extremely controversial. So, so he begins his presidency with you know, a question mark, let's say, over his legitimacy. Um, but anyway, he be, he has basically, as he comes in January 19, you know, nine, sorry, January, January 2001. Uh, and therefore, most of his presidency takes place after 9-11. There's only a relatively brief period. He has about eight months seven or eight months anyway, as president before 9-11 and before you know 9-11, in some ways, I think it's fair to say it sort of revolutionizes American foreign policy. Bush himself, when he campaigns for the presidency in 2000, had actually been rather critical of Clinton's foreign policy. Um, in his eyes, Clinton had been too inclined to intervene, uh, to militarily intervene in other countries. So Bush had not been particularly uh, supportive of the idea of America's interventions in, um, you know, in Yugoslavia, places like that. Um, in particular, Bush and other Republicans disliked this idea of nation building about trying about trying to reconstruct countries. Um, so, in general, I think you could say Bush has a relatively isolationist view of American foreign policy during the 2000 campaign. Um, the third point, as I say there, is that he pledges to conduct a more conservative, small c conservative brand of foreign policy. So as I say, less radical, less inclined to intervene in other countries' affairs. Foreign policy would be governed by the national interest, so for what would be best for the United States. And I have a quotation, I think, from the 2000 campaign, Bush saying, if we're an arrogant nation, they'll resent us. If we're a humble nation, but strong, they'll welcome us. On the other hand, so as I say, Bush sort of articulating quite a conservative brand of foreign policy. I should also say this view was shared by other figures in the Bush administration, not least Condoleezza Rice, who is Bush's national security advisor in his first term. And again, she too, skeptical of the idea of nation building. 
She said, we don't need to have the 82nd Airborne escorting kids to kindergarten. So again, this idea that it was not the job of the American military or indeed the American government to kind of march into other countries to try and rebuild them. However, there were other figures in the Bush administration which had a rather more radical view of foreign policy. And we'll talk a little bit about them in a moment. So although Bush and one or two fairly senior figures were articulating this quite conservative view of foreign policy, there were other people in the Bush administration who, as I say, adopted a rather more sort of radical approach. One feature that doesn't change, and I think it's there from the beginning though, is Bush, Bush's view of how to use American power is quite stridently unilateralist. So what I mean by unilateralism is uh, that the United States basically made decisions on its own without consulting with other countries. So unilateral decisions. And there are a few examples of these. These all occur in the first few months of the Bush administration. Um, so first point ignored the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol had been negotiated by the international community um, at the end of the 1990s. This was an agreement to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Clinton um, signed it. Uh, Bush comes in and announces that that uh, you know his administration would not ratify the Kyoto Protocol, and indeed, you know, Bush makes it clear that he is not you know he he is not interested in trying to tackle global warming. That he you know, he felt that he, he was skeptical about the whole idea of man-made global warming. Um, refused to ratify an agreement on the International Criminal Court. Um, again, the argument was that American soldiers should not be subject to the court's jurisdiction. Um, didn't renew the Comprehensive Te Test Ban Treaty or the Landmine Treaty or the United S or the U.S. Soviet Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. Although Bush does actually uh, reach an agreement with Putin uh, to reduce their respective stocks of nuclear missiles. Um, or the protocol on biological weapons. So the withdrawal from all these sorts of agreements basically reflected the attitude of the Bush administration that it did not want to be limited by various sorts of international treaties and conventions. You know, the Bush administration's attitude was that they would do what was best for the United States, or what they deemed to be best for the United States, and they did not want to be restricted by various international treaties and conventions. So this is the sort of rational, rationale or the justification for America's withdrawal from these various um, agreements. So as I said, Bush administration has about seven or eight months before the 9-11 attacks. Um, but of course, uh, September the 11th, 2001 is a uh, you know, an extremely consequential date in American and indeed world history. Um, so you have these attacks in New York and Washington. They take place roughly, obviously there are several attacks, but they're kind of roughly at about nine o'clock in the morning. I think the first aircraft flies into the World Trade Center, um, which is about kind of early afternoon, I suppose, Euro European time. Um, and, you know, I remember that day very clearly myself. Um, the immediate reaction across the world, uh, and especially in Europe, is one of sympathy for the United States. And there is a very famous headline that appears in the French newspaper, Le Monde, which says, we are all Americans now. Should also be said, I mean, aside from the Europeans, other countries also react with sympathy. I think the first person to pick up the phone and um, call um, George, George Bush after he'd got back to the White House, Bush actually was visiting uh, 
you know, he was outside Washington. I can't, can't remember exactly where he was, but he, he was outside Washington on the day of the attack itself when the news actually came through. Uh, when he finally did make it back to the White House in the evening when his security, um, you know, when the Secret Service basically decided it was secure for him to uh, to, to come back. Um, the first call he took, I believe, with the foreign leader was with Vladimir Putin, who again sort of expressed uh, Russian sympathy and solidarity for the United States. Um, the following day, the 12th of September 2001, for the first time in its history, Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty is invoked. Basically, that, basically it's stipulated that the United States had been attacked and therefore European countries had a you know had the responsibility and an obligation to provide assistance to the United States should be said actually that the Bush administration's reaction to the invocation of article 5 was rather mixed there were certainly some figures in the Bush administration who were concerned that this that by invoking article 5 what the Europeans were attempting to do was to try and multilateralize America's response to this crisis in other words the Europeans were trying to trying to uh, persuade the United States to work through NATO institutions when it came to sort of responding to the attack. Of course, as we've noted, the philosophy of Bush and other senior figures in the administration was actually quite unilateralist. So they certainly weren't particularly keen on the idea of working with the French and the Germans and the British in order to decide how they should actually respond to these attacks. Um, there are also plenty of concerns. And again, I remember this quite well at the time you know there were there was concern in the days and weeks after the attacks that the united states might actually lash out you know there was concern that perhaps george bush after these attacks might might uh, 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 engage in a very sort of aggressive uh, uh, um, um, response and actually i think there was some a sense of relief on this when bush actually initially was somewhat restrained that uh, um, the Bush administration's first moves were sort of diplomatic rather than resorting immediately to, to military force. What essentially happens is that, first of all, I suppose, various sort of financial and economic assets uh, which belong to Al-Qaeda, which were in the United States, were frozen. Um, the United States begins to embark upon a diplomatic offensive to persuade other governments across the world to cooperate it in what Bush announced would be a global war against terrorism. But more particularly, the United States reaches out to the government in Afghanistan, the Taliban, and basically demands that Osama bin Laden should be actually handed over, should be actually be transferred into American custody. Um, there is some, I think, I believe there was actually some debate within the Taliban as to whether or not to accede to the American demand. In the event, they chose not to. And so in October 2001, the United States militarily intervenes in Afghanistan. The United States sends in military forces into Afghanistan in order to overthrow the Taliban government, overrun the various Al-Qaeda bases which were located in, Afghan in Afghanistan's territory. Uh, and above all, there is a desire, of course, to capture Osama, Osama bin Laden. Uh, the leader of Al-Qaeda and the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks. Um, the, the military operation in uh, Afghanistan seems to proceed remarkably smoothly. The United States actually cooperates, works alongside other Afghan groups which were opposed to the Taliban, uh, who were known as the Northern Alliance. United States uses smart weapons, airstrikes, special forces are sent into Afghanistan. And in relatively short time, the United States, United States military are, are occupying Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan, and are seemingly sort of clearing the country out of Taliban forces and Al Qaeda. Um, a new government for Afghanistan is, recon is reconstituted and after by 2002 a peacekeeping mission uh, 
and what becomes known as uh, ISAF, the International Stability and Assistance Force, is deployed in Afghanistan um, after 2002. So the initial sort of military interventions um, in response to the 9/11 attacks seem to, you know, seem to have proceeded reasonably smoothly and quite effectively. Um, Beginning of 2002, though, it becomes clear that the Bush administration is not simply content on dealing with Al Qaeda and um, and uh, uh, Afghanistan, but the Bush administration is intent on widening the war on terror. And as I say, this begins to become quite evident at the beginning of 2002. Um, George Bush, the American president, um, gives his annual State of the Union address to Congress beginning of 2002 and in that speech he talks about an axis of evil in the world and he mentions three countries specifically, three, three rogue states which the, he argues uh, constitute a major threat to American security. These three countries which he singles out are Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. And the implication of this speech was that the United States would deal with each of these countries in turn. Furthermore, the Bush administration releases a national security strategy paper in 2002, um, which talks about several, you know, several things in relation to America's uh, national security strategy, including this idea of preemptive attacks against enemy states, or for that matter, um, uh, enemy uh, terrorist organizations. Um, but there's also much discussion on this idea of spreading democracy throughout the Middle East, and we will come back to this in a moment. So not simply that it was going to be enough to sort of defeat terrorism militarily, but there was also this, if you like, almost more utopian idea of trying to impose democratic governments in various parts of the Middle East. And as I say, it becomes increasingly clear that Iraq will be next on the list of countries that the United States will, you know, was preparing to sort of intervene against. As I say, the National Security Strategy paper, it sort of talks about this idea of imposing democracy. And essentially this vision reflects a view of American power which becomes comes to be known as neoconservatism. So there were a group of figures within the Bush administration who, as I say, become known as the neoconservatives. So going back to what I said earlier about when Bush becomes president um, and his campaign in 2000, and Bush sort of articulates quite a conservative foreign policy. Um, as I said, there were, were certainly other figures in the administration, including this guy, Donald Rumsfeld, who we, who we will talk about in a moment, um, who advocated a much, much more radical agenda. Um, and as I said, these, you know, the, this, this group of individuals were known as the neoconservatives. So you have Donald Rumsfeld, who was Bush's Secretary of State, you also have Bush's vice president, Dick Cheney, who I think very much belongs to this camp. Um, the deputy defense secretary, Paul Wolfowitz. Um, there are also figures like John Bolton, who I mentioned earlier, who was briefly Trump's national security advisor. And as I say, was for a time um, the Bush administration's ambassador to the United Nations um, in uh, around this period. All these figures, as I say, have a much more radical view of American foreign policy. And their view is that was that the United States was the world's most powerful country, um, that the United States had a prodigious amount of military power at its disposal. And their argument was that the United States should use this military, military power in order to make the world a better place. And one way of making the world a better place was to defeat terrorism and to establish democratic governments in different parts of the world. Now, these ideas were extremely controversial, not least in Europe, and we'll come on to that in a moment. 
Um, but again, reflecting the sort of unilateralism of the Bush administration, this quotation here sort of summarizes the sort of neoconservative view quite well. Donald Rumsfeld at one point saying, the mission determines the coalition. The coalition must not determine the mission. What he basically means by that is that the United States should do what it felt best. So the United States should decide what the mission actually was. And those countries who were willing to work with the United States could do so. Those who objected to the mission could choose to exclude themselves. Um, but Rumsfeld essentially saying here that the coalition must not determine the mission. In other words, the United States should not modify its mission just to keep its allies happy. So again, this kind of unilateralism uh, was very much evident in the sort of neoconservative view. So they have this, as I said, they have this very sort of almost utopian view of what the United States can accomplish by using its power, especially its military power. Um, but they, but the neoconservatives not remotely interested in working through international institutions. <coughs> Sorry, the United States would have to do what it thought it, you know, what it felt was best. And in, in its own interests. And as I say, those countries who wanted to work with the United States would be free to do so. Those that didn't, as I say, could exclude themselves. So this is very much sort of the context for what happens in 2002. As I say, George Bush gives his Axis of Evil speech. Um, he singles out Iraq, Iran, North Korea. And as I say, the implication was that the United States was preparing to use military force against each of these three states. Um, and first on the list was Iraq. So in the, and again, I remember this period pretty well, you know, summer of 2002, summer in, into the autumn of 2002, there was an awful lot of diplomacy. Um, but as I say, it becomes increasingly clear that the United States is preparing to go to war against Iraq. And there are several reasons for this. First of all, there was a suspicion on the part of some neoconservatives, and I think Dick Cheney, the vice president, sort of subscribed to this view, that Iraq had in some way been involved in the 9-11 attacks. So there was a feeling that Saddam Hussein's Iraq, which was a sort of forsworn enemy of the United States, that Iraq must in some way have been involved in the attacks. There was absolutely no evidence to link Iraq to the 9-11 attacks. Um, and indeed, Osama bin Laden and the Iraqi dictator were hardly natural allies. Um, Osama bin Laden, sort of radical Islamicist. Uh, Saddam Hussein, brutal authoritarian leader though he was, he was actually secular. You know, he was not, you know, he was not a religious. You know, he was not a religious figure. Um, so, yeah, as I say, these two were not natural allies and there was little to no evidence to really link um, Iraq to 9-11 attacks. But as I say, key figures in the Bush administration nonetheless felt that probably Iraq was involved in some way. Um, then there was the issue of weapons of mass destruction. Um, and the fact that Iraq was widely suspected of, uh, of developing and perhaps being in possession of some form of weapons, of, of some form of weapons of mass destruction, so biological, chemical, and even nuclear weapons. Um, it was known in the 1980s, for example, that uh, Iraq was trying to develop nuclear weapons. Um, when the first Gulf War in 1991 came to an end, part of the peace agreement uh, between the International Coalition and the Iraqi government was that the United States had to end its programs for uh, developing WMDs um, and, that it, and that it would be obliged to allow United Nations weapons inspectors into Iraq in order to verify that the country had no weapons uh, had no weapons of mass destruction and in the 1990s you have a series of kind of disputes conflicts with iraq when at various junctures 
Saddam Hussein would expel the weapons of weapons inspectors. International sanctions would be imposed. Occasionally, military actions, such as I think in 1998, when they were when United States and Britain launched a kind of bombing campaign against Iraq. Um, the weapons inspectors would be let in for a while and then expelled again. Um, by 2002, the Bush administration was making it clear that it expected Iraq to fully comply. And indeed, um, Bush, largely, I think, at the behest of his friend and ally, Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, um, Bush, Bush supports, supported the idea of introducing a United Nations Security Council resolution, which is passed. Uh, I, I think in September or November, I forgot to check, September, November 2000, 2002. And this resolution warns Iraq of serious consequences if uh, Iraq failed to allow the weapons inspectors in uh, and to verify. Um, 1441, resolution 1441 was controversial though because it was unclear whether or not it actually authorized military action against Iraq if it failed to, com if it failed to comply. So it did not actually stipulate what these serious consequences would actually be. And certainly some countries which voted for it, including France and Russia, felt that um, another Security Council resolution would be required in order to authorise military action against Iraq. The Bush administration, who weren't that, um, who, who weren't particularly concerned about the United Nations anyway, felt that 1441 was more than enough to justify um, going to war against Iraq if Saddam Hussein uh, uh, failed to comply. So a division with the international community in the, sp in the summer and autumn of 2002 was beginning to actually emerge. And it was becoming clear, as I say in the final point here, that many governments, including, you know, including some of America's closest allies in Europe, uh, were opposed to the idea of launching military action against Iraq. Um, the Iraq war, though, begins March 2003. Um, before that, um, there is a suggestion that maybe another Security Council resolution will be, uh, will, will be, will be presented in order to explicitly authorise the use of military force. But it becomes clear that any, this resolution would be vetoed by probably several of the permanent members of the Security Council. Jacques Chirac famously announces on French television, uh, Chirac being the French president, famously announces on French television that he would vote against uh, any such resolution. Um, but the United States basically goes ahead anyway, launches what were known as shock and awe attacks against Iraq. Um, and there is a brief war in which Iraq is very quickly overrun by American military forces. The British also participate, as, do, as does Poland and several other countries. So Iraq's forces very swiftly defeated, um, to the point at which Bush famously and very uh, controversially um, proclaims in May 2003 that the mission has been accomplished. He actually is, in a, is, an, an, is an American fighter which lands on uh, an American aircraft carrier. He gets out and there's a big banner saying mission accomplished. The trouble is it, the mission very much had not been accomplished. Although, you know, although um, Iraq's military forces have been defeated, although uh, Saddam Hussein had been overthrown and for a few months was in hiding before American forces finally managed to capture him. Um, the Americans now found themselves at the beginning of a very lengthy occupation of Iraq. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the occupation does not go particularly smooth. And I think there were several reasons for that. Uh, first of all, uh, we have Iraq itself. Uh, so just have a little quick look at a map. Um, first thing to note, Iraq is a big country, you know, in terms of territory, you know, this is a large 
you know, this is a large territory. So it was not like the United States was occupying um, Andorra or somewhere like that. You know, Iraq, um, in geographical terms, was a large country in a pretty volatile part of the world. So that's point number one. Um, and I think one of the arguments you could make in terms of why things go so badly wrong in Iraq is Iraq was big and the United States simply did not have enough military forces to actually occupy Iraq. Uh, we will get onto that in a moment. The second thing to note is that Iraq itself was quite an ethnically diverse country. So there were several different groups living in Iraq. Um, a couple of things to say about this. Uh, first of all, um, there was a clear religious divide between Shia Arab Muslims and Sunni Arab Muslims. So two different, you know, two different, two different types of Muslim. Um, then you have the Kurds in the north, and then several areas of Iraq which were, you know, fairly sort of mixed. Uh, between the two groups should also should be said Iraq was majority Shia um, but it had been the Sunnis I mean Saddam Hussein was you know was a Sunni so it was the Sunnis had been if you like the sort of traditional governing class in Iraq so there was this very sort of bitter ethnic divide uh, as I say Kurds in the north as well which uh, uh, you know were not widely liked by any of the other 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 groups um, and I think a general criticism could be made of, 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 of the Bush administration's policy um, in that I think there was relatively little appreciation for the ethnic diversity of Iraq. I think, I think a criticism that could be made of, of Bush and other senior figures in the administration was that they didn't really know, have much knowledge about the country that they were uh, going to end up occupying. Um, as this slide here also says, several mistakes were actually made. Uh, I've already noted the fact that there were simply weren't enough American military forces. So when, when the United States invades Iraq in March 2003, yes, they have enough to defeat the, enough military forces to defeat the Iraqi army and, 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 and to overthrow the Iraqi government, but they simply just don't have enough military forces then for the subsequent occupation. Um, other mistakes made the Iraqi they decided to disarm the uh, disband the Iraqi army uh, which was a very bad idea because suddenly overnight you have lots and lots of unemployed young men on the streets who have been trained to kill um, and I think it's fair to say that many of them ultimately end up at, uh, as part of the insurgency that the United States has to face there's also a policy of debathers can't say it Debathization, <laughs> that's how I say it. Debathization, the Ba'ath Party being Saddam Hussein's governing party. So there was a, you know, there was a conscious decision to try and root out uh, people in the Iraqi government who had been sympathetic to to Saddam Hussein. The trouble is this. The trouble was that the United States needed to have people who knew how the government worked, who could. Who could keep you know who could keep Iraq running as it were um, so by again sacking lots and lots of people that simply created problems you know down the line that, that, that suddenly uh, suddenly the government itself begins to stop functioning properly um, as I said not enough American troops to maintain order so you know as the as the US army moves in looting breaks out so people start breaking into shops stealing stuff lots of other things and yeah America there aren't enough American military forces to actually restore order or to stop these things from actually happening another criticism that has been made of, of the way the Bush administration occupies uh, Iraq is that the Pentagon was put in charge the Pentagon obviously being the US Defense Department now obviously the military uh, were you know were the ones who were waging war against uh, against Iraq um, however once the war was over you could make a strong argument that Iraq should have been 
you know, the, the job of, res of, of running Iraq should have been transferred to civilian authority. So perhaps somebody in the State Department. Um, one problem with having the Pentagon in charge was that you do see a continued, if you like, militarization of American policy, meaning that the Americans rely far too heavily on their military in order to, to administer and run Iraq, which perhaps creates problems. And as a result of all these of all these factors, within four months, the United States finds itself facing a very powerful insurgency in Iraq. An insurgency meaning that suddenly forces emerge inside Iraq, which begin to sort of challenge um, um, uh, the American military presence. And this situation gets worse and worse to the point at which, by 2006, Iraq has become a major sort of crisis. American foreign policy. You know, thousands and thousands of people are, 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 are being killed in Iraq because of this insurgency. Baghdad basically becomes the most dangerous place on earth. Um, hundreds of American soldiers also being kind of caught up in it. So, you know, as I, as I says, you know, the American and Iraqi casualties, the list of these actually grow. Obviously, the Iraqis suffer uh, suffer even more than the uh, uh, even more than the Americans, um, and again, as I say on the on the on the PowerPoint here, but yeah, essentially the United States military becomes increasingly overstretched. There just are not enough men on the ground to maintain order in the country. Should be said that the Americans basically managed to stabilize the situation in Iraq after two thousand six when George Bush authorizes what becomes known as the surge so he's he ramps up the american military presence in iraq to the point at which they do actually manage to get some kind of grip on the situation so so the situation in iraq is sort of stabilized uh, uh up by 2007 so by the time bush leaves office beginning of 2009 it seems as though um, the worst is over in terms of in terms of uh, uh, the disorder um, inside Iraq. Nonetheless, as I say, and we'll get on to uh, talk a little bit in the next class about how Obama uh, manages uh, the situation in Iraq once he becomes president. Um, nonetheless, as I say, Iraq does become a major crisis, and critics of Bush basically say this is a crisis that he himself you know has made that you, the united states did not necessarily have to go to war in 2003 um one phrase which was used quite a lot by 2005 2006 was that you know if you break it you own it um meaning the united states had broken iraq and they were now responsible for it um, other criticisms made of Bush's foreign policy. First of all, it did not bring to an end terrorism. In fact, if anything, um, US uh, military operations in the Middle East had a tendency to inflame opinion in the Muslim world. Um, so in 2004, example, there was a major terrorist attack in Madrid, several trains blown up in a sort of coordinated uh, Al Qaeda operation. Um, something very similar happens in London in the following year and then you have, uh, have a major terrorist attack in, in, in Bali as well. So terrorism very much continues. Obviously since then we've had other terrorist attacks in Europe, uh, Spain, uh, Belgium, France, you know, so yeah, war on terror certainly did not bring terrorist attacks to a conclusion. Um, Another criticism which I've just sort of alluded to is the fact, you know, criticisms of the Bush administration and the neoconservative philosophy, philosophy was that they seem to have very little understanding or appreciation of the regions which the United States was engaged in. So whilst this, uh, this vision of a democratic, stable Iraq um, was something that may well have animated Donald Rumsfeld in the State Department or Dick Cheney, the Vice President. The fact is neither of them had... had uh, I, do, I think Donald Rumsfeld might have actually visited uh, Iraq briefly. Um, but, you know, they, they had very little knowledge of the countries which they were, which, which, you know, they were proposing to intervene in. And as, as I said, you know, no real appreciation of, of the ethnic makeup of, of, of these countries. Um, the absence of allies, 
made the operations more difficult. I mean, the United States did have some allies, but as I say, Europe quite divided. I mean, ultimately, the United Nations does take over some of some American responsibilities in in, in Iraq, uh, which again is somewhat ironic because initially, of course, uh, uh, the Bush administration had not been overly enthusiastic about using UN institutions. Um, Another criticism was that Iraq distracted the United States from defeating Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan. So certainly critics, I mean, this was a criticism that Barack Obama makes during his 2008 presidential campaign. He, he basically said that the Iraq war was an unnecessary distraction from Afghanistan. Um, so yeah, dem democratic challenges sort of compare Afghanistan and Iraq and to them you know Afghanistan to some extent is the sort of good war or the war at least that the United States should be prosecuting. Um, Iraq as I say was kind of written off as as at best a sort of distraction. Um, an even more significant criticism and one I'm quite sympathetic to is that it essentially opened up a front for Al-Qaeda another front in for Al-Qaeda in the in 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 the Muslim world. Um, Al-Qaeda did not have much of a real presence in Iraq until, um, you know, until um, uh, um, um, 2000, 2003 and the American invasion, but by toppling Saddam Hussein and creating basically conditions approaching anarchy in Iraq, um, the United States presented uh, Al-Qaeda with an opportunity to move in there. Al-Qaeda ultimately, of course, morphs into the Islamic State, and uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about a little bit about that um, in the next class. Uh, but essentially, as I say, you know, paradoxically, Iraq was probably the one part of the Middle East where Al-Qaeda did not have much of a presence before 2003. As I say, Muslim opinion in the Muslim world was quite inflamed. You know, there were accusations that the United States was primarily interested in securing um, access to Iraq's oil supplies and things like that. Um, and Islamic television channels like Al Jazeera also uh, you know, become very, very critical of you know, and their coverage also, as I say, heightens concern in the Muslim world about what the United States is doing. Uh, so this leads us on to this idea of blowback, this idea of taking decisions. Um, but, uh, you know, as I say on the first First, first point on the slides here, you know, the idea that American foreign policy actions have consequences, not just consequences, I should say, but actually unpredictable consequences. Uh, so you could argue that Bush's very fateful decision to launch an invasion of Iraq in 2003 has huge consequences, many of which we are still living with today, that, that essentially it basically profoundly changes the face of the Middle East. Uh, and, you know, again, if you were a critic of Bush, you could say that American actions uh, ultimately have a very, very sort of destabilizing effect inside, in, inside Iraq. Um, one thing you could argue is that Al-Qaeda itself was potentially uh, you know, a consequence of previous American policies. So we talked about the fact that uh, during the 1980s, the United States shipped arms to radical Muslims in uh, Afghanistan because they were fighting the Soviet Union, the Red Army there. Um, Al-Qaeda, for example, had associations with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in the 1960s. The Iranian Revolution, 1979, also has a very radicalizing effect on the Middle East. And as I say, arming the Mujahideen, the sort of Islamic fighters in Afghanistan also has consequences. Um, also, of course, you have America's pro-Israeli policy, which we've talked about in in a, in a previous class, which again also sort of animates Muslim feeling towards the United States. Um, so yeah, as I say, this idea of blowback, this idea that the United States taking certain decisions and these decisions having very profound but also very unpredictable consequences. Um, in 2008, uh, President Obama uh, was elected and comes to office at the beginning of 2009. And as I've already mentioned in passing, you know, it, it, Obama uh, was very, very critical of the war on Iraq. In fact, one of the reasons how, why 
he won the Democratic nomination against Hillary Clinton was that uh, you know, he had not actually supported the war in 2003, whereas Hillary Clinton had actually voted in favour of the war in the American Senate um, in 2003. Um, when Obama comes into office, as I say, you know, he is the guy who's sort of faced with the situations in Afghanistan and Iraq. And we'll talk more about Obama and his, his, his policy. Suffice to say, I think it's uh, and again, we'll go into this in more detail in the next class. Obama, I would characterize as being a relatively reluctant interventionist, or at least when I say reluctant interventionist, I mean reluctant to put large numbers of American soldiers on the ground in different countries. And I think you can see this reluctance coming to the fore on several occasions uh, during his administration. Uh, one thing, and again, we'll talk about this in more detail next week, one thing that Obama uh, becomes uh, well known for is relying very heavily on drones to eliminate terrorists and Al Qaeda suspects. Obviously, during Obama's administration, and we'll talk about this as well uh, in the next class, um, Osama bin Laden is finally captured. Uh, he's found to be residing in Pakistan, and Obama authorizes a sort of special forces military action to capture. Uh, say to capture to kill I should say Osama bin Laden and you know, his body is taken away and disposed of um, and I suppose one of the interesting questions which we'll consider is the extent to which under Obama uh, you basically see a sort of continuation of the Bush administration's policies when it comes to the war on terror and as I say we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in the next class